Velopunti's late lecture courses on nature shed an interesting light on the ontology of the flesh that he elaborates in his last unfinished work, Visible and Invisible. They're interesting not only because of the fact that Merleau-Ponty privileges the ontology of nature as the way toward ontology. They also attest to the importance of the studies of animal life for the development of this ontology. Yet strangely, in the visible and the invisible, this importance is hardly made explicit. In my paper, I would like to join the theme of animal life with another theme that underlies Merleau-Ponty's ontology rather implicitly than explicitly, namely that of rhythm. Several scholars have already pointed out that Merleau-Ponty's articulation of flesh in terms of a chiasm between the flesh of the body and the flesh of the world is fundamentally rhythmic. I believe that by highlighting the rhythmic dimensionality of the flesh, we can come to a fuller understanding of the importance of animal lives for the ontology that Merleau-Ponty begins to elaborate during the period of his last unfinished work. In the following, I will begin by presenting a preliminary understanding of rhythm in reference to Merleau-Ponty's phenomenology of perception. Second, I will highlight some passages in Merleau-Ponty's second lecture course on nature that discuss animals and their relation to the environment. Third, I will show how the question of the human corporeality and of the ontology of the flesh arises in relation to the studies of animal behavior. And from there, I will turn to the visible and invisible and propose a more detailed interpretation of the chiasm as rhythmic articulation of body, things, and language. And finally, pardon me, it's a long itinerary. itinerary. Finally, from within Merleau-Ponty's ontology of the flesh, I will then move back to the issue of animals and lives in our cosmic encounter with them. So I start with a preliminary understanding of rhythm. Just like Augustine argued about time, rhythm is something that we experience intimately and yet something that tends to escape our conceptual grasp. It tends to escape our conceptual grasp, especially if we dismiss the reductive understanding of rhythm as the repetition of countable measures. And if instead we seek rhythm as a lived phenomenon, as something fundamentally constitutive of any form of movement and of any form of life, Rhythm in this sense is not a form of measure and does not necessarily imply a repetitive pattern. Rhythms imply durations of movements of things and events and caesuras that mark the beginning and ending of durations. They are always multiple and complex with durations of different lengths that overlap or encroach each other sometimes with patterns that we distinguish because of their repetitiveness. A single living animal is already a complex of rhythms if we think of heartbeat, breathing, and all the other movements that we find in bodies. If then we open up our understanding of living beings and view them as beings that are temporal, ecstatic, fundamentally relational, and in constant exchange with the environment they live in, the picture becomes even more complex. If we nevertheless want to pick up the challenge to think and speak about rhythms, rhythms that we know intimately from the lives and events that we live, we need to find a conceptual approach to rhythm that does not attempt to objectify it. We need to find a form of reflection that feeds from the ways we experience rhythms which of course through our bodies, a form of reflection that transposes this experience into language in such a way that the language echoes these experiences. We find ourselves here right at the center of the problematic that animates Merleau-Ponty's thinking. How to think and grasp conceptually the Lebenswelt, the world we live in, and that we inhabit fundamentally through our bodies and how to understand the arising of language, thought, and ideas in it. The later Merleau-Ponty critiques his early attempts at thinking and articulating the life world. He believes that the phenomenology
your perception fails because in this work he still thinks in terms of the distinction between consciousness and object. But there are also places in this earlier work where Merleau-Ponty's descriptions foreshadow the intertwining or chiasm of body and world that he would articulate in his latest and unfinished work, Visible and Invisible. This is made evident by al Saji, who shows this in her reading of the first chapter of the second part of the phenomenology of perception titled Le Senti, Sensing, by pointing out how sensing and sensible intertwine in a rhythmic encounter. In the chapter Sensing, Meroponti considers sensing viewed from within in a reflection that does not objectify the act of sensing but rather accompanies the corporeal experience, the movements through which it occurs. In this chapter, Meloponti also draws from inductive psychology that has found that the vision of color is tied to a physiognomy of movement. Movement precedes the vision of color in the sense that it exposes the body to perceive. What then will reveal itself, for instance, is the color blue. Before being seen, a color announces itself through the experience of a certain attitude of the body, an attitude that fits only that color and determines it with precision. Now the attitude that the body takes, its physical disposition to see a specific color, is in turn solicited by the color seen. This means that there is a certain synchronicity between sensing and sensible at the very moment that the sensing of something is initiated. In this context, Meloponti speaks of a rhythm of existence. This is, in fact, one of the very few places where he explicitly speaks of rhythm. The word rhythm. I quote again. I find in the sensible the proposition of a certain rhythm of existence, abduction or adduction, and following this proposition, gliding into the form of existence that is suggested to me, I relate myself to an exterior being, be it in order to open or to close myself to it. Here, sense perception is neither initiated only by a subject nor only by an object to which the subject would react. Rather, there is a synchronicity between sensing and sense. As Meroponti writes, I quote again, the sensing and the sensible are not one in front of the other like two exterior limits. And sensation is not an invasion of the sensible into the sensing. It is my vision that subtends the color. It is the movement of my hand that subtends the form of the object, or rather, my vision couples itself with the color. My hand with the hard and the soft. And in this exchange between the subject of sensation and the sensible, one cannot say that one acts and the other suffers, that one gives sense to the other. As Al-Saji explains, what allows for this synchronicity, for this coupling of sensing and sense, is rhythm. I quote earlier, the explicit moment of sensing then comes in the form of a bodily response in finding the singular rhythm and pattern of movements that can resonate to that aspect of the world. And that allows me to see blue. When we speak of a rhythmic correspondence that allows for perceptions to occur, and that is not simply rooted in subjectivity. The rhythmic correspondence or coupling of sensing and sensed, it was a term of Belfonti, precedes the fully articulated perception. I see the color blue because my body has found the rhythm that resonates the color blue. I hear a bird because my body has found the rhythm that resonates the singing of the bird. 
Even though the phenomenology of perception still uses a language that distinguishes subject and object, we can see that there are places where the phenomenon that Berlusconi has in mind undermines this distinction. At the same time, we can see where the issue of rhythm emerges in Berlusconi's thought, at the intersection of sensing and sense, of body and sensible things to which it relates. Between sensing and sense occurs a rhythmic intertwining such that a perception can occur. And this rhythmic intertwining appears to be in the first place corporeal, not cognitive. And now to the second section of my paper, the rhythms of animal lives. Colonel Ponty clearly seeks the roots of our experience of the world and of our knowledge of this world in the body. A body that is experienced and defined in many ways, but that in all the ways that Meryl Ponty articulates it is not a closed off entity, but is fundamentally and dynamically open to what it relates to. In the visible and invisible, Meloponti focuses mainly on the human body as a site that opens an ontology of the flesh. He takes an approach, so to speak, from the inside, from the inside not of a human consciousness or human subjectivity, but rather from the inside of our experienced bodily intertwining with the world. In the three lecture courses on nature, Meroponti takes a different route that suggests an approach leading from an outside to an inside. Of course, we're very careful with these terms, outside and inside. Um, in the sense that the route goes from an observation of animal lives to the experience of our human lives. The route goes from a critique of Descartes' causally and mechanistically determined uh, ontology of nature and the attempt to ground a new ontology of nature in the first lecture course to the study of animal behavior in the works of Uxku, Russell, Lorenz, and Portman in the second lecture course. And finally, to the question of the human body in relation to animal lives and at its intersection with nature in the third lecture course. In what follows, I will consider especially Meroponti's discussion of Ixkul. Ixkul's interpretation of animal lives that he studies from the amoeba to the human fits strikingly well with the way Meroponti views the corporeal intertwinement of body and world in the visible and invisible. In his second lecture course on nature, Meroponti focuses especially on Ixkul's notion of umwelt. Uxke conceives the Umwelt as an animal's environment of behavior that does not necessarily, but possibly, exist for its consciousness. In this notion of Umwelt, Merleau-Ponty sees a, quote, an intermediary reality between the world, such as it exists for an absolute observer, and a purely subjective domain. <coughs> that seems to address that intermediary realm of corporeal intertwinement that Merleau-Ponty explored in the, already in the phenomenology of perception, and that he would conceive even more radically in the visible and invisible. Of special interest for us here is Uxkul's treatment of higher animals, in distinction to lower animals that constitute a sort of cohesion with their world. Higher animals imply the construction of a Gegenwelt. Gegenwelt literally means counterworld. In the construction of a counterworld, the animal differentiates itself from its environment and thus emerges as an open temporal unity. More specifically, through their central nervous system, Higher animals differentiate, order, and respond to external stimuli, which Uxkul understands to be a linguistic activity. By forming a counterword, Ingwelt, the central nervous system corresponds to a Weltspiegel, he says, a mirror of the world. Uxkul further differentiates the Gegenwelt, the counterworld of higher animals, into a Merkwelt, the world of noticing, in the Wirkwelt, the world of action. The Merkwelt is relative to the specific sense organs of an animal that organize and classify stimuli. 
in the Wirkwelt, the word of action, the reactions of the animal in the milieu, the melodies of impulses. Uxgur's account includes in this also um, human habitual behaviors. Thus, the world of the animal is not separated from its life. In fact, the animal life is formed into, in relation to its world and also forms its world in what Uxgur describes as a specular relation. Admiral Ponty says the animal is produced by the production of the milieu. Both both emerge together. This milieu, Meloponti continues, is radically different from the physical world with its specific temporality and spatiality. In fact, Merkwelt and Wirkwelt have their own specific temporality and spatiality, which leads Uxgur to speak of a Merkzeit, a time of noticing, and a Wirkzeit, a time of action. Merkzeit and a Wirkzeit that are specific to animal lives. The noticing time is not a conscious time or the time of consciousness, but rather, I quote here, a component of the physical structure. Time is a component of the physical structure which is manifest in the behavior of the animal. We can get a sense of the particularity of the noticing time in different animals if we think of a tick that can lie dormant for 18 years, waiting to send some warm blood underneath, or of a cat waiting to see a prey. Merkzeit and Wirkzeit are shared within different species, and within their milieu. But there's also the crossing of the of animals from different species, as more pointing points out. We may at this point go a little beyond Merleau-Ponty's interpretation of Uxfühl in his lecture course and conceive the temporality and spatiality that are proper to the physical structure and behavior of animals as rhythms specific to different animal lives. Following from Merleau-Ponty's language in The Visible and the Invisible, we may say that animal lives and their counterworlds are formed through differentiation in a rhythmic intertwining, such that animal lives and their worlds emerge together. So rhythm is what articulates lives. Further, there is also an intertwining of rhythms of different animal lives, including our own, that need to be taken into account. A cat that follows its prey, let's say a bird, participates in the rhythm of the bird in its environment and only in this way is able to anticipate its movements and to catch it. Uxkul uses an interesting metaphor to speak of the temporality of Umwelt and of animal lives. This metaphor illustrates the insufficiency of an explanation of animal development and behavior through the notion of cause and effect, as well as the insufficiency of conceiving the temporality of animal lives in terms of a linear development of past and future now. Uxkul speaks of, I quote, the unfurling of an umwelt as a melody that is singing itself. This metaphor points to a variety of things. First of all, to say that the unfurling of an animal environment and with it the animal life to which it belongs is like a melody that sings itself, tells us that there is no agent or organizing principle outside of the occurrence of an event. The environment of an animal life organizes itself, and one cannot explain in terms of cause and effect how a life form is organized. Explanation of cause and effect can especially not account for the life. The metaphor also points to the temporality of the animal in its environment. As Merleau-Ponty points out, the melody brings with it a particular consciousness of time. Quote, in a melody, a reciprocal influence between the first and the last note takes place, and we have to say that the first note 
is possible only because of the last, and vice versa. It is in this way that things happen in the construction of the living being. What Merleau-Ponty finds in Luxembourg's descriptions is the possibility to understand animal life not as a substance to which things happen, not as a thing that relates to an environment that lies outside of the animal. And animal life is not a thing that endures for a certain amount of time. It is itself temporal. It unfurls like a melody. As Merleau-Ponty says, I put again, the organism is not defined by its punctual existence. What exists beyond is a theme, a style, all these expressions seeking to express not a participation in a transcendental existence, but in a structure of the whole. The body belongs to the dynamic of behavior. Behavior is sunk into corporeality. In his second lecture course on nature, Merleau-Ponty develops this latter point in relation to the studies of Russell, who conceives behavior as a physiological activity in external circuit. This means that it would be reductive to conceive an animal primarily as an organic substance. Rather, an animal has its being in something like a theme or style of an organism that includes both physiological and behavioral activities. What he says in regards to the enduring or unfurling of the theme or style of a living being, also of a trans-temporal and trans-spatial element. Quote, we must admit in the very fabric of physical elements a trans-temporal and trans-spatial element of which we do not take account by supposing an essence outside of time. The trans-temporal and trans-spatial element of which Merleau-Ponty speaks is not a super-temporal and super-spatial element, but rather an element that transverses the particle trans indicates, transverses time and space, yet in such a way that time and space come to be in the transversing. Time and space of living being. The melody sings itself and is what it is in the singing of itself. The physical, the corporeal thing as which we usually would conceive an animal, merges into behavior, leads into an environment, unfolds through self-differentiation its own temporality and speciality, its own rhythm, and thus comes to be what it is. No outside principle directs this happening. No external call determines it. Merleau-Ponty expresses this fittingly as he comments, comments on the metaphor of the melody that sings itself. From the center of physical matter surges an ensemble of principles of discernment at a given moment, which means that in this region of the world there will be a vital event. If we now consider the innumer innumerable organisms that exist, each unfurling their milieu in the crossing with other milieus, a sense of life emerges that is far away from the teleologically or mechanistically conceived nature, and that has no overarching order or principle of life. At the end of a section which Meloporti addresses the oriented character of organic activities, we find the following remarks that have more the form of unfinished notes. Quote, Phenomena of life turn around certain hinges. Themes are again dimensions. The establishment of a certain field of gravity. Themes, styles of living beings, form dimensions that have a certain gravity, that draw other events into their field, cross other fields of gravity, or not touched by them. 
Here the question of how human the and field of gravity also arises. Third section of my paper, titled The Emerging of Humans. Bill Conti addresses our place in relation to nature in his third lecture course of 1959-60 with the title Nature and Logos, the human bond. <coughs> the notes of this lecture course are contemporaneous with the working notes of the visible and invisible. The task of this lecture course is to take the human at his point of emergence in nature, which means that, I quote, the human is to be taken in the in einanda with the inherence in animality and nature. Bellamonti's idea then seems to be to let the human emerge in the nexus of dimensions of living organisms that he elaborated in the previous lecture course. <laughs> that yet the human emergence at the same time in its difference, a corporeal difference, as Merleau-Ponty notes, in which humans distinguish themselves from other animals. This otherness has nothing to do with the difference in substances, but rather with the difference in manners of being a body. Quote, Merleau-Ponty, the concern is to grasp humanity first as another manner of being the body, to see humanity emerge just like being in the manner of a watermark, not as another substance, but as interview, and not as an imposition of the for itself on a body in itself. It seems paradoxical. The the peculiarity of human life lies, among other things, in its manner of inheriting in other animals. One may say that we are human not by virtue of being substantially separated from animals, but by being them in a particular way. The difference between human and animal is sought in their intertwinement. We will have to see then how, on the one hand, humans are fundamentally connected with animals and how they are different. Malopotis notes on his third lecture pick up the previous descriptions of Bitskul and attempt to describe the emerging of human life in the midst of the nexus of the fields of living organisms. He brings into play right away the structures of perception that he elaborates in the visible and the invisible and appeals to the theory of flesh that will make it comprehensible how my body is a circuit with the world in Einfühlung with the world, with the things, with the animals, with other bodies. A little later he describes the emerging of the human life as follows. In this arrangement of flesh, then there appears or emerges vision. There's birth. That is, a new consciousness surges forth, as does life in physical chemistry. New consciousness surges forth by the arrangement of a hollow, by the eruption of a new field that comes from the interworld and is not the effect of antecedents. Thus the eye, with its nervous apparatus, takes on the sea. We could pick up the earlier metaphor for animal lives and say that a new melody surges forth that sings itself and that has the principle of its being in nothing else but its own occurrence. The birth of human corporeality happens through the arising of perception and with it of a new consciousness. And we are not yet speaking of objective consciousness here or self-consciousness. With the arising of a new consciousness that Meloponti describes as the arrangement of a hollow. This refers to the negativity that Merleau-Ponty addresses in his notes to the visible and the invisible as the center of the chaos or intertwinement of sensing and sensible. This hollow or negativity belongs to the invisible of the visible, which one may indicate preliminarily, as Merleau-Ponty does, by referring to it in terms of an interiority of the living organism. He says, 
we know already that there is a natural negativity, an interiority of the living organism. Now we understand it. Here, interiority does not refer to some invisible soul substance, but to a negativity that is like the other side of the visible. Animal lives cannot be reduced to their visible aspects, as Uxgur has already shown. An animal is what it is in relation to an, its environment, whether to other living beings. And the unity of a living being lies more in a certain style that persists, this is trans special empathy, that persists through its organic and behavioral activities. So unity is far more there than in a thing like body that one sees at a certain point. At the same time, the interiority of a living being is expressed through its visible aspects. Sometimes it writes that visible is in dash visible. Merleau-Ponty speaks in this context, so the invisible is expressed through visible, in this context of the symbolism of the body. Such a symbolism is not unique to humans. In the second lecture course, Merleau-Ponty's reading of Uxküll and Pogman indicates that it is found also in animal lives. In fact, this is also a little bit trajectory that we find in, in this lecture course in nature, which shows how um, we find um, expression already in, in animal um, lives. Uxküll's account of a specular relation that higher animals have insofar as they mirror the world in processes of ordering and differentiating stimuli of their environment implies that at least, higher, uh, at least higher animals symbolize. One may call this with Uxküll a linguistic activity that arises through the construction of a gegenwelt, a counterworld and maybe also, with Merleau-Ponty, a tacit language. Also, Portman's studies of animal appearance points to a symbolizing, for example, in ornamentation and sexually oriented displays. Here, Portman claims the animal body appears as a manner of expression that cannot be explained by the principle of utility. The appearance of animal signifies. Perception and movement symbolize, says Merleau-Ponty, and this is true for both the human body of animals. He adds a little further in the text, quote, an organ of the mobile sense, the eye, the hand, is already a language because it is an interrogation, a movement, and a response, such as I'm feeling, speaking and understanding. It is a tacit language. In how far the tacit language of different animals is and ours is similar is another question. It is certainly not the same. We can thus follow Merleau-Ponty's claim that the difference between animals and humans must be sought at the level of corporeality, at the level of the silent language of our bodies. It does not make sense for Merleau-Ponty to understand the human as an animal substance and on top of that has reason and language. Rather, our bodily and rhythmic intertwining with the world must occur in a peculiar way. In fact, in such a way that we come to form concepts, ideas, and to speak words. Come on to the next section. Let us turn then to the visible and invisible in order to see how Merleau-Ponty describes the emerging of the human body. In order then to see how human language becomes possible. The emerging of the human body occurs through its encroachment with sensible things. Quote, the body unites us directly with the thing through its own ontogenesis. Its own coming to be, the body united with the thing. By welding one to the other, the two contours of which it is made, its two lips, the sensible mass that it is, 
and the mass of the sensible from which it is born by segregation and to which, as seen, it remains open. Remember that the form of self, the differentiation in animal life, there is a, there is a, a similar occurrence here. Similar but different. The sensible mass from which the body is born by segregation is flesh. What Merrill he calls flesh, what has no name in philosophy, is an element of being and the means of communication between sensing and sensed. Insofar as sensing and sensed first emerge through and in it. The quote, it is the coiling over of the visible upon the seeing body, of the tangible upon the touching body. The visible and my body are made of the same flesh, a flesh that is not a static element, but a dynamic element that occurs as a coiling over and as the distance of sense and sense. The flesh of the body and the flesh of the world approach each other and emerge in their difference by segregation. This movement is one of spatialization and temporalization, such that Merleau-Ponty can conceive the flesh as, I quote, a spatial and temporal pulp where individuals are formed by differentiation. The recoiling movements of spatialization and temporalization that segregate elements such that individuals are formed are rhythms, rhythms of the flesh. One can experience these rhythms of the flesh when one remains alert to the ontogenesis of one's own body. Let us consider in this respect the following passage by Melopoulos. It's a rather lengthy quote. What makes up the weight, the depth, the flesh of every color, of every sound, of every tactile texture, of the present and of the world, is that the one who grasps them feels himself emerging from them through a kind of coiling over or redoubling that is homogeneous with them. That he is the sensible coming to itself and that in turn the sensible is in his eyes like his double or an extension of himself. The space, the time of things are shreds of himself, of his spatialization, of his temporalization and no longer a multiplicity of individuals that are synchronically and diachronically distributed but rather a relief of the simultaneous and the successive. The spatial and temporal part where individuals are formed through differentiations. In this passage, Merleau-Ponty expresses a double movement, a double coiling over of the sensible, which is described in relation to how one experiences it if one follows an event of sensing carefully. First, I feel myself emerging from the depth of the sense, maybe a color or sound. I feel myself emerging through a kind of coiling over or redoubling, such that I feel myself coming to myself as the sensible coming to itself. The sound of steps, for instance, emerges at the same time that I become aware of myself. Second, in the movement in which the sensible returns to itself, to my eyes, says Merleau-Ponty, the sensible becomes like my double, or an extension of my flesh, such that the space and time of things appear as Merleau-Ponty says are, space and time of things are shreds of the perceiving body. This allows me to experience things, as I said later in the text, from the inside, experience things from the inside, insofar as I am among them, and that they communicate through me as a sensible thing. 
The source of the ontogenesis of the body remains a blind spot. Merleau-Ponty conceives it as negativity, the center of the encroachment of sensible. sensible. He calls this negativity also gap, point zero, openness, dehiscence, and a point of jointure where multiple entries of the world cross. <coughs> One may say that the gap at the center of the chiasm is the caesura that delimits the rhythmic articulation of things and events. The caesura marks both the joining and the dehiscence through which sensible things are articulated rhythmically. One can witness this through one's own body, insofar as the body takes place as a temporalizing and spatializing dehiscence, such that the body comes to experience itself both as belonging to the sensible and as sensing the sensible. When a party calls the dehiscence of the body also negative body, this Negative body, the dehiscence that articulates the body into sense in sense, is also the point where language and thought emerge. In other words, the rhythmic connection between body and language lies in the negativity at the center of the chiasm. In relation to the possibility of speech, this negativity is a negative language that articulates the silent language from which words can emerge. Words emerge then from a negativity that we experience as a temporalizing and spatializing dehiscence in our own bodies. Thus, Meloponti can say, the one who thinks, perceives, etc., is this negativity is opening through the body to the world. The one who perceives and speaks is therefore not a positive entity but a negative subject. As Merleau-Ponty says, the duality, negative body, or negativity, negative subject. Is. No, sorry, the duality, negative body, or negative language is the subject. Body and language encroach at the negative center of the chiasm, where, as Merleau-Ponty says, multiple entries of the world cross. Language joins and emerges from the rhythmic articulation of things and events through our bodies. And this is why language is able to express things and events in such a way that words make sense. Words can make sense not because they carry <coughs> anything that is arbitrarily joined to signifying words, but insofar as they are born in the midst of the intertwining of body and things, of myself and others, and thus can find a sensible resonance in the body that listens and understands. In order to express something in words or make sense of what somebody says, we need to find a rhythmic connection that is similar to the rhythmic connection that underlies sense perception. We may say that words echo sense perception. Make the make the sense. It is then that we have the sense that what somebody says hits the target. Of course, not all words are expressive in such a way that they echo our bodily and rhythmic intertwining with things and events. This goes along with the distancing of body and world that is a consequence of the adhesives of sensing and sense. Once we become conscious of ourselves as distinct being and conceptualize things as distinct from us, we cease to sense them as threads of our own temporalizing and spatializing bodies. A word then becomes a tool to designate things, and the link between signifier and signified appears as arbitrary. This is why Merleau-Ponty differentiates the expressive and original operation of language, of the church's passive language, from a secondary form of language, namely language in terms of a historically formed system of science. It is, of course, the former that allows us to understand the passage from the silent world to the spoken world. This is the case not only because in our bodies is already 
inscribed the possibility of language, but also because our being includes our community with other human beings. A world that opens in chiasmic relations is always an intercorporeal world. Others are at play in every perception, such that when I come to myself in the chiasmic relation to the perceived, what opens, says Merleau-Ponty, is a fourfold system, by being for me, by being for the other, for itself of the other, and his being for me. Unlike Sartre, who has already pointed out these different modes of being in relation to the other, for Merleau-Ponty, these take place not primarily at the level of consciousness, and the other is not primarily a positive subjectivity. In a working note, he says, I quote, in reality, there is neither me nor the other as positive, positive subjectivities. There are two caverns, two opennesses, two stages where something will take place, and which both belong to the same world, to the state of being. It was long. Last very short section. Um, it's a strange tension. At this point, I would like to bring up again the issue of animals and animality and ask what place they have in that intercorporeal world that Merleau Ponty speaks of. Are animals not also caverns, opennesses that belong to the same world, the same stage of being? Should we not further differentiate the fourfold system that articulates our being only in relation to other <coughs> beings of our own kind? In his third lecture course on nature, Merleau-Ponty says that the human is to be taken in the inner and under, the intertwining with animality and nature. And we can see that Oxford's explorations of animal lives played an important role for articulating our intertwinement with the world, for opening the stage of an ontology of the flesh. The question now is if we can join the road that in the third, so no, not, not just in the third, if we can join the road that in the lecture course on nature leads from the animal to the human, from the inside. That is, whether we can find the way from within, the ontology of the flesh that unfolds through the experience of the dehiscence in our bodies back to the end. How does the recoiling of flesh occur when our bodies emerge from encounters with animal bodies? Do we experience animals like sensible things as extensions of our own bodies? Do we experience their temporalization and spatialization from within, like shreds of our own spatialization and temporalization? Do we share a language with them that emerges from our cosmic encounter with them? Especially when we think of animals with which we live, we can sense that we communicate with them through our bodies. We can sense when they're calm or afraid or even hungry, we can find a rhythmic resonance of their fear or relaxation in our own bodies, since how cats can lower our blood pressure and help us to relax. But there are also moments in our encounters with animals where we find no resonance in our bodies and where the rhythmic connection is missing. It is missing not only because we maybe are not familiar with certain animals or because we don't pay attention to them, it is missing because the possibility of rhythmic connection is not there. The inner world of animals, to take an expression of Uxford, has its own temporality and spatiality, with which we cannot find a full resonance within our own bodies. Our environments can encroach, partially overlap, but there are barriers that we cannot overcome. One of these barriers has to do with language. Our bodies find articulation in relation to things and others through a recalling, effective motion that not only joins but separates us from sensible things to which we relate. 
This bears the possibility of language, of conceptualization and spoken words. But once we grasp things through names, we extrapolate a sense from things that takes on its own being. Thus we open another dimension of sense that bears in it on the one hand the possibility of expressing things in such a way that their sense resonates with it rhythmically in our bodies, but that bears on the other hand the possibility that this rhythmic connection is lost. Animals cannot answer to our questions conceptually. They cannot answer our questions conceptually. They lack that distance to things that allows us to extrapolate a sense from things, a sense that takes on its own being in word. And yet, the manner of not answering that animals have is different from the way the stone cannot respond to our questions. Because in the silence of animals resonates an inner world that at moments we can sense through a rhythmic resonance for our bodies. What distinguishes then our relation with animals is that they both allow and resist a rhythmic connection. By being both familiar and strange, the hollow that marks the singular being of an animal exposes us to the negative body and negative language that we are in a particular way. Thus animals can open for us the sight of brute being, silent language, and with that, the possibility of a language that transposes the silent sense of being into words in such a way that it resonates the rhythm of things. Take 
we could take a concept, if we take concept as a closed off defined unity, which, which I grasp it, concept, bottle, this is a bottle, that is a bottle. No, if we take concept in that primitive sense, no. Rhythm has nothing to do with that. It's a temporal occurrence, so I can never fix it down you know, with, with a concept like that. But um, I believe there is a way in the discourse to indicate the appeal to our experiences to indicate um, rhythm events. Can you want to start that? I have some problem about this too. The, 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 at the end uh, of, of uh, your uh, presentation, because uh, it uh, ends up uh, uh, reproposing the uh, hierarchy of, uh, of man, uh, animal, and the stone, uh, which uh, we can find in, in Heidegger. And in my opinion, this is not the same thing uh, in Meloponti. In Meloponti, uh, first of all, there are many interesting uh, references to stones. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, for instance, when uh, uh, he uh, speaks uh, uh, about uh, uh, empathy, um, commenting on uh, uh, the notion of uh, Earth uh, in, uh, in Husserl, there is this uh, idea that uh, uh, I can uh, uh, throw uh, uh, a stone up and uh, uh, feeling that uh, the stone flies. Mm -hmm. So, this is a way through which Merleau-Ponty uh, develops uh, uh, his uh, idea of uh, uh, the flesh, uh, which is the flesh uh, uh, of the world, too, not only uh, of the, uh, the other human beings and uh, of the animals. So there is a, a flash of uh, the stone, and there is a, therefore a resonance of my body with uh, uh, with uh, stone too, which uh, in principle is not, uh, in my opinion, different from. In principle, ontological. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that uh, it's a risk to suggest that this is a kind of ontological hierarchy. Well, I, you know, um, I sympathize <laughs> with not the hierarchy totally, but at the price of, of uh, losing difference, no. Because uh, there, I think. I I'm interested, uh, it's just me, but I imagine that he would be interested also in saying that different beings in this world. And um, when I, uh, certainly there is, flesh is not just animal bodies, certainly not. But should I not account for a difference in um, the way I relate to uh, other human beings? animals, stones, and indeed within, you know, the infinite realm of, of, of plants, of events, of sky and earth and the elements, should I not be able to account for differences there? Yeah, but not in the logic. Where, where, where would you put the difference then? What level would you put it? So you would, you would maintain a difference between the ontological and the ontological would see that that's what you wouldn't your um, difference between um, uh, encounters with other human beings and um, so. the, the, uh, we are uh, 
we animals uh, uh, and the stocks mm -hmm. are uh, in the same ontological life. Well, can I, can I interject something? Because I have probably a different version of a similar question. Namely, how do we bring together what you say to us in the last section with what you say to us in the first? So, so even in terms of what you yourself have, have laid out, namely the first a section devoted to this relatedness, and in fact this co-responsiveness vis-à-vis the color group, right? And it, is most, it was precisely in this context. Uh, so I even a color, not even a stone, but even, even this uh, 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 further problematic category of the color, right? And you have developed it in terms of uh, precisely responsiveness. Uh, the body finding the rhythm that resonates the color or with the color. Right? So then, uh, granted, uh, I, I, I think that you're right. I mean, what is at stake is precisely allowing for the difference such that uh, it is not a matter of indifference whether the, 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 the vibrating responsiveness is a relatedness to the color blue or to another living being. But then, okay, let's say more about how we differentiate. Because, I mean, we're really talking here at the intersection between phenomenology and ethics, right? So, so how do we differentiate? How is the responsiveness, uh, um, uh, this finding the rhythm that, that puts uh, me in essence, uh, that, that, with that color, how, how is it the same and different from this, this complex corresponding with, with, with other lives. Um, I, would, I would say that the difference has to come from what we encounter. Um, you are the expert on Mero Conti here, so and if you say Mero Conti uh, would say uh, in, in, in his ontology wouldn't make that differentiation, I would start from a critique of Mero Conti and would say, well, uh, And um, I'm more interested in an ontology, and I think the difference we can arrive at uh, or, or is evoked by what we encounter. It is not that I project myself differently from myself to different things. I think that, that the different, different beings we encounter within a species, with different species, um, they, they evoke different um, rhythmic correspondences different manners of being. And so I'm more interested, I'm interested in finding this, this uh, um, peculiarity of the difference. And so I think this is where we find that. Uh, find that. Uh, what is, what is, uh, I have a plan of writing about animals, you know, I just read this, and all of a sudden something connected this way. You know, there's a certain way of being, <coughs> being typical in animals. Um, they have their own worlds, and they expose us to them. They expose us to their own rhythms. So you could find the same in a stone. Certainly, in this, in, uh, other uh, events also evoke different um, rhythmic correspondences. But there's something in this silence um, of an animal to which I relate um, that touches upon this this. Um, what I find compelling in, in Melo Ponti um, is, is finding this, this what he calls brute being, finding a way, a way of addressing being on the level of corporeality. So I just follow that world in this case. Jane? First of all, I thought it was a really elegant paper. And I'm fascinated by the topic. Um, so, I want to begin with a, a little absolute agreement and then some queries about, about the project. The agreement is uh, how to bore Faith and Paul because I was teaching back in the afternoon and I was arguing that, that it's very much about the origins of meaning in rhythm. Um, and I was using Christeva's argument about the semiotic, that 
that the, the movement of the body, the movement, the sound of the voice, all these things are the antecedents of meaning without which there could not be meaning. So the thought that there are bodily and rhythmic anticipations of meaning that are its material conditions of possibility, I think are absolutely correct. I mean, I just think that that has to be right. Um, so my wanting to, to say that, that, and that's a place where I'm comfortable, and this is my question, is I'm comfortable with the language rhythm there. But you want to use the notion of rhythm in a whole lot of other places. And, and, the, and my really question is, um, why that concept? And in order to kind of sharpen the question about why that concept, I want to ask about some other concepts that people have used to analyze, I think, the analogous phenomena. So, so I think that the story time is the right kind of story. I don't see why rhythm is the right way to think about it. So I guess the first uh, bundle would be something like, what's the relationship of rhythmic attunement to notions like mimetic identification and empathic identification? So I think that uh, when I empathize or identify with my cat, um, I know what nurturing is, I know what hunger is, I know what fear is, I know, so that there's a whole shared world of purposiveness that allows, and the fact that we are sentient and suffer, so I don't know about rhythm, I think there's a, a, a much stronger notion of aliveness and what it is to be a living being that allows for and is the connection to uh, so the question is, why did you choose rhythm there? That one? And then the second area, and it's I guess inevitable when we talk about this topic, so the, the the color one. I guess I was reading uh, I was reading a PhD this morning, dealing with this problem of animal perception, um, and it was on Aristotle, and he would have used the language of potentiality and actuality. That of course. I have to be predisposed to see blue in order for blueness to appear. Why is the language of rhythm preferable to the language, to the Aristotelian language, um, where um, because the Aristotelian language has the, the um, advantage that it can cover a whole range of other and analogous cases? and can account for learning. Rhythm seems tied to, let's call it, this preconceptual notion of attunement. So I'm kind of fascinated why, beginning with the thought, we agree that there's got to be rhythm in a deep sense, somewhere in, in the years of the emergence of meaning. Why do you want to use it in these other areas? Or again, just one more analogy. I was kept thinking of J.J. Gibson, uh, its ecological theory of perception, where the perceptual world is a series of affordances. And, you know, so it has the same thing as Merleau-Ponty, but with, I thought, a much more fine-grained sense of the contouring of the world in relationship to the habitual body. Again, rhythm seems to me a weaker term than a much more refined character. So I was interested why you wanted to use rhythm in all these places. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, it has to do with my project. <laughs> <laughs> I guess. <laughs> oh, thank you. So, yeah. Um, yeah um, there's always a background to why what one does, what one does. Right. But the, the background in this case um, is um, really for me trying to explore an, an ontology of particular um, that um, that doesn't operate in the distinction between ontology and ontic that is able to merge the ontic dimension into the ontological. That means I have to find a way to account for beings um, that um, does justice to their singularity. And I believe in uh, one of the most important uh, elements in there is, is time and time and space. 
question at the time, because what has bound, I think, in, in the history of the West uh, due to, to this subjectively oriented way of looking at the world as to the fact that we think that time is a subjective, yeah, a subjective element, you know, the stretching of the soul, it is the, uh, the form of, of the inner intuition, that allows us to order the world so that the world appears for us. Yeah? So we are the makers of the world. Now the idea is how can I account for the uh, undo that? Or my sense is it doesn't fit. There's something that doesn't fit because it doesn't allow us precisely to grasp singularity. So rhythm for me is an attempt to speak of the singularity of, 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 of things. Of, and finding a way of speaking of the time and space of things uh, that is not a subjective projection. So, of course, as a philosopher, I also know I cannot take myself out of the picture. Right? So, again, um, where do I find the time and space of things? I find it in the intersection yeah, between my, my experience and, and, and the way things show themselves. So um, I'm looking for a, a way of speaking of things that remain, you know, that, that takes its primary direction from them, yeah, and not from an imposition onto them. And there I think, so I take rhythm, this is why this is this very large, I apply to so many things, as a means of, of um, accounting for articulation. The continuity of time doesn't segregate, but I think that uh, the singularity are formed in and, and taking also lives, forms of life as Heidegger, not as static means, but having a sense that whatever is, is temporal movement. And so what allows to articulate being is rhythm. So I'm trying to use the notion of uh, rhythm, to work with the notion of rhythm to account for the for the articulation of things. And of course, the articulation of things that I can um, address only uh, in, in also by reflecting on my relation to them. So this is why I'm using rhythm here. So um, and rhythm doesn't do everything. Yeah, it's, it has its limits, this notion of rhythm that I'm working with. And so I, I, I don't want to take away from Aristotle, you know, that I cherish very much, uh, and I don't want to take away from, from uh, the language of mimesis and empathy, but they don't do the work of articulation. Um, and this is why, uh, in this case, I'm focusing. Could you, just follow just could you have rhythm without mimetic identification? I mean, after all, I see a tree blowing in the wind, right, motion, and we get our, our, our fundamental relationship to things outside us by, by adjusting ourselves to them. So, mimesis is the very act by which human beings adjust to the life world. But where do you get the sense of otherness in there? Because the mimetic accounts for the connection, it doesn't account for the difference, because it's an other that I that right. But, but in, in this account, you start with the other, and you have to figure out the difference of you, right? Mesis begins with the other as primary, not you. You adjust to it. The question is not, uh, how do I count for the tree's difference? It's how do I count for me if I'm just swaying like a tree? So this is an account where the world takes absolute privacy. That's not what it's based. Uh -huh. Yeah, maybe uh, then my, my question would, if my approach would be a little bit more genetic. Because I certainly uh, find, I think, I, I do think that there's, this is why I like, part of why what I like about my point, there's always the double difference in energy. You know, we don't find an identification uh, without I think that uh, both, there are always movements of, of differencing and, and articulation um, at the same time that there is a, a, a partaking. Um, and again, um, maybe one people have to, to you know, work on that supplement for the, the idea of rhythm and, uh, with, uh, 
the notion of new races, but uh, you know, as Britain cannot do all, I think new races cannot do it all either in this case, as I try to explain. Yes. I guess one question is somewhat related to what Jane was asking about. It's very simple. What about reading, for example? Meaningless physical pain. Because all the language of rhythm commits us to talking about attunement, articulation, vibrating responsiveness, those words that you can use. Whereas pain somehow means, uh, it seems to me in a way, um, physical pain, or vile, or, or violence, for example, or even psychical pain, or strong depression. It seems to me that uh, um, if we want to stick to the similarity of things, as we argue, it would be like too forced to, to uh, give an account of it. Um, the rhythm of a week all over again. I mean, things changed on Friday. Things stopped. You went and you bought your flowers. Saturday there was no transportation. You went and you could do a visit. It was a sheer exhilaration of the rhythm and the repetition. I, I say exhilaration because we can take the variation. And that seems to me even the way you were talking about it. So I would see that this is antithetical. I mean, it's articulation, clearly, but singularity? It's, it's the repetition of every week being like that, or every month being like that, or the flowers are coming. But I don't quite get grasp why you think rhythm is the proper way to give 
No, I'm not talking about articulate, because the very notion of articulation seems to be a bold iteration, but that it somehow is, uh, gives us singularity. I don't care. <coughs> I don't want to come down on a, on a flat-footed notion of rhythm. That's why I use iteration. Because part of the excitement is a slight difference. But it's not singular. Is it? I don't think... Uh-huh. I take it that the, the fundamental of yoga is articulated movement. Yeah. And... and um, I guess the, the, the question then is why would any articulated movement be about something singular rather than what it sounds like, namely about a pattern? So it looks like it's the emergence of universality, um, not about singularity at all, because it is patterning before concepts. I think this is exactly where um, taking rhythm in terms of repetition um, um, is in fact that which takes us to the notion of universality, or notion of information of concepts, but also formation of concepts. That makes sense, but is based on, on, on rhythm. So to say rhythm draws us to think to 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 general patterns. It doesn't draw us to the singular you say. Um, and at the same time, and of course, these are rhythmic, uh, rhythmic events. Person can go further. There's there's rotation of the stars, and the heavens, and all of that. Um, these are rhythms that that um, are always there. And we would have to take into account. But in some way, you said it yourself. It's repetition, but it's not no, I, always the same. But the main question. So, so there there is a sense also. You express the sense of uh, something, even in repetition, um, an element that, that escapes pure repetition. But I think, if we think of rhythm as a lived phenomenon, not as a measure, no, I understand, I understand it. So, um, in that sense, yeah, but one would have to, to um, sharpen one's sensibility to what is not just regular. No, um, but I think that's not the issue. I mean, I think that you began by saying that you didn't mean just read the pattern, and I agree with that. Yeah. And if we even go back to the example I gave, okay. every week is different. Yeah. Although there's a kind of pattern to it. But I still don't see the why this illuminates in the lack. That's what I don't get. It emanates out of the city, right? It emanates it. I mean, yeah. what do you mean emanates? Because, I mean, every week. If we go back to a week, a week is singular. It's not the same as the next week. It's different, and so forth. You couldn't have a pattern unless you had it. But I don't see that. I mean, we, that's why I say, you know, it, you didn't bring in singularity in your main talk, but you did when you answered. That's yeah. true. Yeah. That's what threw me. Yeah. That's what, uh, what wouldn't be relevant. It remains the most difficult challenge for philosophy. Let me say one other thing that I thought that I thought were two things are fusing together. Mm-hmm. That really, I think, are distinct. One is this problem of singularity patterns and uh, articulation. But that's completely independent of a subjective objective distinction. I mean, at one point you said, you seem to suggest that you want to get away from a subjective sense of temporality. But it seems to me the question about whether temporal, temporality is to be seen as subjective or objective or in the situation or neither it is conceptually independent of the issue of singularity and, uh, and, 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 and pattern. You seem to think that they were intimately related and I see them as distinct. I just lost the last part of the question. But, you know, as you're speaking, your voice exhibits rhythm. Sure. Which is not just repetition. No, 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 I just and that, that but the articulation of your voice as I hear it is what gives it the singularity right now as you hear, I, I hear you speaking. I'm scared. But, but, but yeah. may I, may I, may I uh, again interject, just take advantage of my... See, we can't stop. <laughs> I look at it from the first day. So, so 
So, but first of all, I'm a little bit uh, curious about this, the, the nonchalance with which you're bringing seasons and moons together. Because seasons are really by nature. They're really not human constructs. And weeks are. The calendar is, is a human construction, a human subdivision. The day is a natural cycle. The week is written. So, so there is, and this, this you know, Yurigarai makes a lot out of these distinctions. And look, I mean, human artifacts have that, that, that quality of, and, and especially in, in, in terms of technical reproducibility, have this characteristic of brilliant, being repetitions of the same and being unproblematically countable. No, but I like, No, no, let me finish. Whereas, whereas <laughs> just, just to You're give a You're misunderstanding me. Why should I give, finish? <laughs> but I, but I, I, I think there is more that I want to say before you judge if I'm misunderstanding you or not. Because I think that if you think about, uh, seriously, about uh, uh, natural rhythms, the difference really between something human created and natural rhythms, such as a day, the alternation of day and night, or of the seasons. The seasons, which, by the way, do not last three months each, because that's human convention. Good. Spring does not start the 21st of Good. March, right? So if you think about such natural rhythms, they are and are not countable. In a way, you are counting days, but they are never the same. No two days, uh, in the sense of the alternation of light, uh, light and, and darkness, are the same length. Um, they are constantly changing such that literally no two days constitute a given unit that, that could be uh, considered equivalent. So they are and are not countable. And, and in this sense, I think that uh, by looking, for instance, at natural rhythms, not technological reproduction, we come very close to this attempt at grasping something regarding the intersection between the singular and the universal. Because as we are trying to think through the singular and, 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 and to uh, hold the singular in attention, we are not thereby simply opposing any movement of universality. Of course, we are trying to think the two together. The way in which this is utterly singular and definitely is like no other day. And at the same time, the way in which, yes, uh, it is one day in a series and in an unfolding of days, right? And, and both. And both these things are happening, such that you do have both the patterning and hence this thrust towards the universe, or some grasp of the universe, and at the same time also the absolutely incalculable uniqueness, uh, absolutely irreducible uniqueness of this. The of, of this. So, so in that sense, you know, one really would have to make a very careful distinction between rhythm, as, as, as we said at the beginning of the paper, as a countable measure. And Wait, maybe you better finish. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've had eight years of training at the new school, so you see, this is the result. <laughs> Learn too well for me. <laughs> no, I mean, look, the first point I want to make is, is, is this, is that I was accepting a phenomenological point of view. I am not talking about natural rhythms. I'm talking about how we would experience something, or how we would experience the seasons. So, so in that sense, it isn't a question of the natural order of the seasons coming, but how one in one's own lived experience. But we are both, huh? Let me finish. <laughs> <laughs> Let me finish. Yes. The second point I wanted to make is that I accepted from the very beginning that we're not talking about simple, countable repetition or iteration. The main thing I really wanted to get uh, at is I do not see that the concept of luminous singularity. I think it emanates from singularity, but I don't see if it illuminates it. And that's what you seem to, you seem to be suggesting in answer to that. Maybe we should uh, speak uh, of uh, variations rather than repetition. Okay. Speak about variations is okay with me. Uh, because repetition uh, yeah. is key to, 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 to miss uh, uh, the precisely. Well, that's why you really in terms of iteration, which is never really a repetition. <laughs> okay. But of, course, you know, I, but of course, you cannot simply say, oh, we are not talking about na natural rhythms, as though we are outside <coughs> nature, right? I mean, to the extent we are really trying to delve deeper into this, this even physiological question of perception and enfoldment. I mean, 
we, we can't quite say that. Oh, well, you know, the natural rhythms, no, that's I another mean, business. I meant that you can't saddle me with a simplistic distinction between the natural and the artificial. I want to test my no, own. No, I made a distinction between weak and season. But, but, but that's precisely why it's not a simplistic distinction that rhythm really does both the patterning and the allowing for the possibility of the conception of the singing. Okay, well, in this notion of variation, we'll let other people get into uh, this. That was <laughs> Welcome to the newsroom. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, we gave you a pause. <laughs> well, I'm quite um, happy up to now. <laughs> I was, um, is it my turn now? Yeah. I was thinking about, um, <laughs> seize it. <laughs> there it has articles on uh, Arto, uh, La Parole Soufflé, and there's, there's another one, I forgot the other's name. Um, the gist of which seems to me to be that Arto's project of, of coming up with, with, with a theater of cruelty, a theater of the flesh, and so on and so forth, which I think resonates some of the things we heard here, but, but maybe I'm, I'm just imposing here. Derrida's point seems to me to be that, that, well, two points. First, that there is no such poor language or meta language of the flesh over and above something that we tend to call conceptual or metaphysical language. Um, not, not in the sense of reversing the order, but in the sense of uh, there is no clear cut dichotomy between the two. There's a mistake on the part of metaphysics to think that it is something completely independent of the flesh in general. They can just cover everything. And by the same token, our toes um, diametrical mistake would be to think that, that he can reverse, simply reverse the order and say that there is a language of the flesh that ought to replace metaphysics altogether. So fleshiness, quote-unquote, instead of conceptuality all the way. That's one point. And, and second, and, and I'm thinking here uh, also about, you mentioned towards the end, uh, poetry, okay. as opposed to sort of more conceptual language. So, so poetry versus ordinary language or, or conceptual language would here be Artaud's theater as opposed to metaphysics. The second point that seems to me that Derrida is making here is that that, um, that relates to the question of whether what we're looking for is still within the boundaries of philosophy or is it a, a break with philosophy. It seems to me that Derrida is saying that, that Artaud is philosophical through and through, that either there is something which I think Derrida thinks is impossible, which would be a language which is completely non-philosophical, but in that sense, all of Artaud's proposals, and if we go on talking about the flesh, we, we never get out of trying to precisely conceptualize the flesh, and hence we still are, within philosophy. So either there is some radical move we haven't yet done, or, which I think is Derrida's intention, but it's a big question of how to read him here, th there simply is no such radical break. So where do I stand with that? Yes. But okay. Yeah, to end with a question mark. Yeah. Well, maybe I think it was something like this, this rhythm tend to provide a pure language, like our toes. Yeah, with, with my mapping over to the same thing. thing. Well, you know, I do believe that um, true and creative activities, um, the things we do like dance and paint, make music, um, that are forms of expression that are fundamentally mythic and that I cannot capture fully when I speak about them. That's why I dance when I dance and I talk about them. Um, so, in, in that sense, um, uh, but now I'm, I'm saying it. I'm saying there, there are experiences or there are rhythmic activities, uh, all activities, but, but let's say artistic activities that clearly um, that express um, uh, rhythm in across clear ways. Um, that have their, their own sense, and I understand that you, you know, one, one, one cannot fully translate, um, but I can indicate it, let's say, that much. So I wouldn't propose this sharp division, um, as, as Arto would. And um, I do believe that Merleau Ponty is, is very sensible at, at um, working in this very different, difficult area of, of this transposition of, of experiences. Um, that I would say are written experiences into language. And, and um, so I, I, I do think there, um, there are connections 
different ways of speaking, not of, of grasping absolutely, but of indicating, of echoing. This. Um, so in that sense, yes, um, there are certain concepts I think, that, that can address these kind of grasp and fully, no. Of course, again, if my, if my expectation of concepts is that they get the whole thing, you know, they inevitably have to fail. So I have to expect something different from language. And also be willing to hear different. So is there so when what we're aiming at ultimately is not some sort of a language or non linguistic <laughs> language of fleshing? We are, we are aiming at it. allowing ourselves to, to, to know that there are activities that are, but there are also experiences I cannot they can, they can say, sure. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm for that. But um, I would never, never speak in an absolute sense. So I have uh, three more questions. Given that we don't have much time, what I would like to do is to hear them. Is that okay with you? Sure. So we hear the three questions and then we may reply. So I guess as simply as possible, it seems to me that one of the things that you're interested in is not so much rhythm, but the making of rhythms. And insofar as that's the case, you're looking for interruptions in the monotony. So what turns a dull tone into a rhythm for interruptions in silence? So the interesting parts are the way that you're trying to thematize very particular ways of being silent. And the ways in which being silent generates rhythms allows for reciprocity. So why not just go with the silence and then drop everything else? Okay, I think mine might just be a question resulting from a misunderstanding, but maybe not. Um, if rhythm is an articulation of being, as you say, then in, in what sense do we gain um, a kind of primary or original language in the sura or the gap of chasm, negativity, um, in which rhythm ceases? Um, so the question is really, how does the blind spot of consciousness and this gap of cessation bring about a little more robust sense of the need if that is supposed to come from rhythm itself? Maybe I've misunderstood. I have a question about the way in which uh, the sense of limit and the limitation might be at work in the, in the work of rhythm that you're doing, particularly in relationship to the question of um, variation for repetition. Namely, it might be the, it might be the case that rhythm uh, is the, uh, the event through which I have singularity and treated in that way rhythm could not be understood as something that would be illuminated to singularity. However, if I understand rhythm in terms of limitation, it seems to me that the discussion of rhythm in relationship to the limitation, then it does help to, uh, uh, to understand singularity by virtue of getting to uh, trying to articulate something like it, the delimitation of identities out of difference, which is something that I don't see happening in the way that repetition or, uh, was just being presented before. And so it's not, it might even be a comment rather than a question. But I think it doesn't call it. It's, thank you. Um, the making of rhythm. I'm uncomfortable with the word making. Well, I mean, in the sense, the happening of rhythm, the occurring of rhythm. The think of it this way: so, phenomenological bias. <laughs> <laughs> so Maria Callas once said that I make my living by barking like a dog. Uh -huh. right. So the the difference between singing uh -huh. and a particular sound yeah. barking. What is doing that? It's the particular ways in which we emphasize silence. Uh -huh. What makes my speech pattern mine uh -huh. are the breaks and disruptions. Yeah. I, I like your, your, your ear for, for silence and interruption, and I think that's a necessary ear um, um, to, un to understand what I want to say when I speak of what um, rhythm is and articulation. Because, of course, an, uh, it's an articulation, it's an articulating. And, and there is, and I think this is also what I got a sensibility I like in, in my own point here, I find, and um, other thinkers have to understand. That is, it is the sense for the interruption, the um, that um, 
that allows you to, to, to get closer to this articulating, to this event um, of rhythm. But it's, it's, it's also the temporalization, spatialization. So while you talked, yes. we yielded. We were silent. We, we gave you space in order to... Right, so there's, there's, there's something about the way in which you presented yourself as a singular particular individual that was reciprocated by us. Right? And then we sat in our various silences, right? various kinds of ways, various kinds of articulations, right? for something to happen. Right? So I mean, the sort of the chiastic element, that gap, yeah, right? there has to be something like extending, temporalizing, spatializing, silence. Now, I mean, it's an articulate notion of silence. It's full of various kinds of metaphorologies. It seems to me that that's what you want. That would be sort of the rhythm then becomes a mediation between the universal and the singular. Right? The singular then becomes the detective instantiations of something that can be repeated like that. Interesting. Thank you. And then the other question, it also went to the gap, right? Yeah. It was a little bit similar, maybe. Well, I, I'm wondering, towards the end you said that language and thought emerges in the past of the cessation. In answering one of the earlier questions, I think you said something like, uh, you want rhythm to be the articulation of being itself. So I'm wondering if in the cessation of rhythm, being also seeks to be articulated. What would the cessation of rhythm be? Well, I, I guess that's the nature of the question. Uh, what, is the, what would that be like if we can't get language from it? If, if we're supposed to get language and consciousness from a cessation of rhythm, what, what, what is the sensation of rhythm? Isn't it the cavern from which uh, language happens? It's not significant language happens. Oh, that might, I might, certainly might have misheard. Or sensation or sensation? Cessation. Like the stopping of it? Yes. Okay. There is no stopping of it. No, no stopping of it. No. Okay. no. <laughs> yeah, because the silence is just another bit of articulation. You can't stop rhythm. It is. That's why it's so not that I want it to happen, you know. Okay. And, and I've, I've misunderstood, but yeah. I still wonder what um, is the negativity of a chiasm or a uh, gap. <laughs> what is the negativity of a gap um, in relation to rhythm, in relation to language? Again, I would understand it as, um, if we go back to my um, answer to, to your colleague, um, my access at least to it would be in terms of the source of origin are bad words here but if we think of, of movements uh, articulate the, the moment of articulation you know, the, the, the source the beginning of it we, we are in what we find are processes of differentiation but the where from, uh, it's not a you know, mysterious origin of some kind, but the where from is like this, this following, uh, uh, this, this gap that is, that is a, a, a gap uh, which allows a difference and it also allows a, a connecting. So it is, it is uh, hard uh, to explain without the um, proper background. Sorry, but um, I don't know how else I could um, get to that. Um, work with silence also. Look for words. When you um, try to find words to express, say, a certain experience you had, it's like you reach for that experience in your, your, your memory, your sensing memory. And at a certain point, maybe it comes. Yeah. But what could you say? What? Where is the point that allowed you to, to find the word, the point that allowed you to find the word? You had to come to a moment of silence, a moment of, of nothing, which is not a real thing. But somewhere there, you found the connection uh, in your physical memory of your experience that allowed you to, to find the word to express what happens. So maybe that can give you a little bit of access to this negativity between this kind. Sure. But I think, I think then the initial way I asked the question might make a little more sense. If this negativity, this nothingness, um, is 
um, is this absence of me, this utter quiet in what sense? Right. We don't see me. Oh, so it's still part of Sure. Sure. Okay. Yeah. All right. That's <laughs> we're, we're really ontologically casual here. We let nothing in. So I say it is the time to party. We have it. <laughs>